first story of the day that I want to talk about is this new mask order from the Center for Disease Control. If you want to talk about a controversial issue, this is one. Okay, I've seen people on both sides of the aisle almost killing each other over the masks. We've seen the department stores. We've seen the grocery stores. Somebody doesn't wear a mask. There's like a level 10 meltdown. Everybody starts hyperventilating in the store. Cops get called. It's a, it's a nuclear bomb went off in the middle of a Safeway because somebody didn't have a mask on. So, you know, we're going to, we'll start the non-controversial stuff tomorrow. Uh, today, the show was already prepped before we got the, uh, the demonetization notice. So we're just going to bang on through with this one. So let's talk about the CDC order. This was passed today, or, or I think it came out a couple days ago, but I just learned about it today. This is the order under Section 361, Center for Disease Control, Department of Health and Human Services. Requirements, this is the big one, the requirements for persons to wear masks while on conveyances and at transportation hubs. And so folks, this is basically everything. It's basically any time that you're moving around in a vehicle. If you're in an Uber, a taxi, a subway, a boat, an airplane, anything like that, uh, you now have to follow these protocols. And so I wanna break this down a little bit. Uh, we've got some text, you're gonna see a lot of text, but uh, we're gonna go through it relatively quickly because a lot of it is uh, superfluous in my mind. So let's take a look at the summary of what this is intending to do. The notice and the order, we're gonna be looking at the US code and the uh, code of federal regulations, so the USC and the CFR, and the summary. Number one, persons must wear masks over the mouth and nose when traveling on conveyances into this within the United States. They must also wear masks on transportation hubs. A conveyance operator transporting persons into and within the United States must require all persons on board to wear masks for the duration of the travel. So in the entire flight, the entire bus ride, the entire car ride, the entire Uber ride, all of that. A conveyance operators, so that's the people who run these things, arriving at or departing from a U.S. port must require all persons on board to wear masks for the duration of travel at, uh, of the controlled and free uh, pratique. I, I don't even know how to say that word. That's an old word, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna butcher it probably throughout the remainder of this. So here is uh, here's another summary, paragraph four. Uh, conveyance operators must use their best efforts to ensure that any person on the conveyance wears a mask when boarding disembarking for the duration of the travel. Best efforts include boarding for those who wear masks, instructing persons that federal law now requires wearing a mask, monitoring persons on board for anyone who is not wearing a mask. And so the question is, well, who is, who's going to be doing this monitoring? Are these employees? Are these federal government officials? Are these the TSA people? Are these, uh, you know, cops, federal marshals, local law enforcement? Who's, who's doing this? Who's doing the enforcement? It all comes down to enforcement for me. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about where this might go and, and you know, for good reason. Now, let me back up on this just a little bit. When it comes to masks, I don't have a particular dog in this fight, right? The mask thing is not the hill that I'm going to die on. Uh, I've seen a lot of people say that this is compliance control, that people who are, you know, who are wearing the masks are acquiescing to the government, taking more control of our lives. Uh, I've seen other people say that it is actually causing people to be more sick. You know, you're, you're breathing in the, your bodily waste to a certain degree. You know, you're, you're exhaling CO2, which is bodily waste, and it's sort of keeping it right here in the general vicinity, and you're breathing it back in. So why would you be doing that? You know, and so they're saying it makes people actually sicker. And, you know, you could also have the idea that if you have an infected droplet that hits the mask, that may not have otherwise hit you, you know, now it's on your mask, you're walking around with that all day, a virus is sort of like a, a dead clump of cells that is still active, it injects itself, and now it goes into your into your body, it's, you know, it's, that, that's a bad, the, the medical doctors out there, please don't skewer me on that one, but, the, you know, the point is, it, it now would linger on your mask, you would inhale it all day, which would almost, you know, virtually guarantee that you do get coronavirus, right? that's one side. The other side is, hey, we got a million studies, all the doctors say to do it. It's something that you'll see in hospitals. You know, it, the, sort of the consensus crowd is saying that all this stuff is justified and you should wear a mask because if you don't wear a mask, uh, you're going to be responsible for killing grandma. And so, you know, I don't, like I said, I, I, I really, I wear a mask. I don't have any particular problem with it. It makes a little bit of sense to me in the sense that it is just one additional barrier on your face. Before I went to law school, I was a pool boy. I actually used to clean swimming pools. And so, you know, we would use nets to clean the leaves off the floor. And there would be times where, uh, you know, the net wouldn't catch some of these smaller particles because the smaller particles in the pool, whether it's a, you know, a small leaf in Arizona, we have these mesquite trees that have these really tiny leaves. And so those would be in the thing in, in the pool and the, the net wouldn't catch the leaves. But then what would happen would be you would get enough leaves, you get enough, you know, bigger debris 
in the net that it would scoop up the smaller leaves. And then eventually, if your net was actually somewhat full, you could swoop up even dirt, you know, that would otherwise just pass right through the, uh, the, the net. And so you could get a lot of stuff in there because you had a barrier there. And so, in my, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was sort of thinking, all right, well, even though, even though the virus particle may be, you know, a million times smaller than the pores that you would see on the mask, maybe if you get enough of the, you know, the fabric there and you get a little bit of, of friction, you get a little bit of a barrier, maybe it does something. I don't know. Right. Okay, fine. They want me to wear a mask. If, if they'll open the gyms and I can go work out with a mask on, I'll wear the mask. I prefer that to having a closed gym or a closed business or a closed uh, entire economy. So that's kind of where I fell on this whole thing. Uh, just, just for full transparency, I really don't, uh, you know, I really don't think it is a giant government conspiracy to domesticate a bunch of people. I also don't think it is the cure to COVID, right? I don't think that it's going to solve all of our problems. I think that it's probably a shiny object. We've talked about this before. Masks, in my opinion, are the shiny object. If we're, if we're killing each other over masks, if we're out publicly facing one another and you see somebody with a mask and somebody without a mask, and now you can you know, have those two people at each other's throats, then you're not talking about the decimation of the economy. You're not talking about people you know, losing businesses that they've been building for the last 10 years, basically in a year, gone, gone with the wind. You're not talking about you know, certain politicians in this country sending old sick people who are riddled with coronavirus back to nursing homes so that they can infect the rest of the population at that facility. You're focused on other things. You're focused on the mask. It's a shiny object. Is it really relevant? Maybe, maybe incidentally, I don't know. Is it going to solve America's coronavirus problems? No, absolutely not. And then it's, their response to that, of course, is, well, it's compliance. It's because nobody's wearing the masks. Okay. So, all right. So, you know, you, you can see where this argument goes, but I just wanted to lay out my, my position on the mask before we get into it. When I was reading this document, I was uh, particularly concerned about, uh, or I was trying to identify where they were discussing their sources. Where did the evidence come from? You know, a lot of this stuff that we have been talking about as it relates to masks and coronavirus is sort of, you know, the game of telephone. It's, it's, he, it's hearsay. He said, she said stuff. Somebody said masks work. Somebody said masks don't work. You know, Fauci said they didn't work. Then they do work. Now wear two masks. Now wear five masks and so on and on, you know, and on and on and on. The information's so bad. So, you know, one study comes out, masks are terrible. The other study comes out, masks will, will cure everything. And what are the sources? Well, the CDC does give us some. So let's take a look. They say monitoring persons on board at the earliest convenience and opportunity, disembarking any person who refuses to comply. So if you don't wear your mask, you are out of there. You're off. Just get off. Providing persons with prominent and adequate notice to facilitate awareness, compliance of the requirement of this order to wear a mask. Best practices may include, you know, notification on platforms, apps, websites, emails, posting signs, and other stuff. Operators under paragraph five, so the people who are running these transportation hubs must also use best efforts to ensure that they're only allowing people in who wear masks, that all people know that federal law requires masks. They're monitoring people on the premises of the transportation hub for people not wearing a mask. And once again, who is doing that, right? Who are these people who are uh, wanting to enforce compliance at the earliest opportunity, removing anybody who refuses to comply, providing persons with adequate notice. So same type of thing that we saw in paragraph four. Now we're going to look over at specifically what they are referencing. What is, what are the sources on some of these, on some of these documents? So here under, uh, we, we look here, we got some definitions for persons, number one, and we can wear masks. We have that over down here. So number one, persons, the definition of persons includes travelers, passengers, and crew, anybody who operates the transportation hub to wear a mask means you got to wear it over the nose and the mouth. And so this is where you start to run into an issue of subjectivity. So the people who are enforcing these, we're going to see that they have a lot of leeway to follow these rules kind of however they want to. And it's, and it's very subjective. And there's a difference between subjective and objective, right? Objective, it means it's, it's basically, you know, universally true that this thing is, is what it is. Subjective is it's kind of however you interpret it, right? What, what makes me happy is going to be different than what makes somebody else happy. We have our subjective personal experiences for happiness. There's not a universal happiness. And some people might debate that, but uh, this is not a philosophy show, but you get my point. So when we're talking about enforcing mass, it's, the standards are going to be very hard to follow. One person might take a look at a mask and say, okay, that's properly being worn. Another person might say, no, that's a little bit too loose. Somebody might say, no, it's covering my nose. If it's like this, somebody might say, no, I want it up here. You know, I want a, a you know, a cellophane wrap on your face where other people have bandanas. Some people have, 
you know, face shields and things like that. So we're, we're talking about a lot of room for interpretation. And when something like this can venture into the criminal realm where potential criminal charges can be pursued against an individual who is out of compliance, now we're talking about just a whole, a whole ball of yarn that is going to be messy if it is enforced as it could be, according to their own documents. As a condition, so this includes all international, interstate, interstate waterways, as a condition of this controlled free uh, pratique to commence and continue operations in the United States, conveyors must additionally require all persons to wear masks on board when they're leaving the U.S. until they arrive at a foreign destination. So even if you're out of the country, you still have to wear your mask and then they define mask and so this is what the definition of a mask is it's a material covering the nose and mouth of the wearer and it excludes face shields and you can see here in footnote six a properly they're, they're, they're defining this stuff for us okay so this is an official document this is not like a suggestion there we're going to get to the enforcement provisions here shortly they're at the end of this entire segment a properly worn mask completely covers the nose and the mouth of the wearer a mask should be secured to the head including with ties or ear loops so now we've got some other right you've got some other uh, potentials if, if the mask is outside of, of compliance it could be criminal a mask should fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face what does that mean snugly but comfortably it's probably different for every single person masks do not include face shields they can either be manufactured or homemade they should be a solid piece of material without slits exhalation valves or punctures so uh, how do you decide what that is, right? People are going to have difference of opinions on all of those things. Medical masks, N95 respirators fulfill the requirements of this order. The guidance attributes acceptable masks in the context of this order, and it's available at the mask travel guidance. So, you know, if this thing didn't have potential criminal ramifications, you might be looking at this and going, oh, who cares, right? If it's a piece of cloth on the face and they want it, they don't like it, then you change it, you know, double wrap it, whatever. But just wait, we're going to see what is possible under the new law. So we see here, in addition to wearing a mask, this shall not apply under any of the following circumstances. A lot more rooms for subjectivity. Subjectivity. While eating, drinking, or taking medication for brief periods. What does a brief period mean? While communicating with a person who is hearing impaired, when the ability to see the mouth is essential for communication. So is everybody now going to have uh, difficulty hearing? To take their mask off to talk on an aircraft, wearing of an oxygen mask is needed because the cabin loses pressure. If you're unconscious, good news, you don't have to wear a mask. When necessary to temporarily remove, remove the mask to verify identity, such as during the TSA screening or when asked to do so by the ticket gate or any law enforcement official, then you've got to take your mask off. And uh, once again, a lot of room for subjectivity. So now you can decide or not whether or not whether a person's hearing impaired, whether they're actually eating still or not. You know, if you, somebody comes up and says, hey, you're ma put your mask back on. You say, I'm eating. They say, no, you're not. You're done. You say, no, I'm not done. Criminal charge, arrest that man. So, uh, you know, who knows if it's going to get to that. I'm doubtful that it is. I'm hopeful that it won't, but we don't know anymore. Uh, people are getting arrested for memes these days. So the background, and this is where I thought this was interesting. So we're going to see some language that is just conclusory. We're going to see some language that is just sort of uh, putting the facts out there and not offering any supporting reference or any supporting footnotes. Then we're, we're going to see some other language in here that is covered in footnotes. We have a lot of resources, a lot of material that we can dive into a little bit. So I, I didn't, I'm not clipping this entire document, but I wanted to just show you a little, uh, a little bit and bits and pieces of it. So the background, there is currently a pandemic of respiratory disease, coronavirus, and it's saying that there has been 2.14 million deaths. As of January, 2021, we got 25 million cases identified, 415 deaths in the U S and all of this stuff is footnoted. So we got footnote nine. There's a narrow exception. Uh, disability stuff, uh, footnote 10, they got a, a White House press briefing. And then footnote 11, they're indicating that there is at least one new strain with evidence of increased transmissibility. New variants have emerged in recent weeks. And so uh, just brace yourself for this. You know, I'm, I'm fully expecting there to be many, 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 many new uh, uh, variations, variants of COVID. And it's something we're going to be living with for a long time. And they reference back down to the CDC a new strain down here in footnote 11. So we've got some pretty good sources. 
Then we drop into another paragraph that doesn't really have any sources. It says the virus that causes COVID-19 spreads very easily and sustainably between people who are in close contact with one another within about six feet, mainly through respiratory droplets. Uh, no, no notes, no footnotes on that. Uh, it, it's the respiratory droplets are produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. These droplets can land in the mouth, eyes, nose of people who are nearby and possibly be inhaled into the lungs. And you might be saying, well, you don't need a footnote for that. This is pretty, you know, pretty standard stuff. But I still, you know, I still have, sort of have questions about this. Is, is it respiratory droplets? Is it 100% airborne? Uh, you know, I would have liked some footnotes. Infected people without the symptoms, asymptomatic, and those in whom symptoms have not yet developed, pre-symptomatic, can also spread the virus. So I think there's a lot of questions about that. Maybe these have been answered. Maybe I just haven't seen them. I'm not a COVID person. Uh, I just, you know, I just, I haven't seen anything about that. And I do follow the news pretty clearly. So people without symptoms, I thought I've read articles and headlines that if you're asymptomatic, the likelihood of transmitting it is basically non-existent. Now we have pre-symptomatic. So you have no symptoms, but you're sick, and then you're pre-symptomatic, so are you sick? And there's no footnotes. They can also spread the virus, so I don't, I don't know where they're getting that from. In general, the more closely an infected person interacts with others, and the longer those interactions, the higher risk of the spread. Obvious, right? I think we all know that. COVID-19 may be transmitted by touching surfaces or objects that have the virus on them, and then touching one's own or another person's eyes, nose, or mouth. And I thought I saw some other information that the surface stuff wasn't that big of a deal. Remember this? I remember. And we've been covering this stuff for a long time. And they said that, that you know, the virus originally could like, live on a surface for like 30 days. And then everybody was going bananas with the sanitizing everything. I saw people outside the grocery stores literally spraying their spouse down with Lysol before they got into their cars because of this hysteria. So does it live on the surfaces for 30 days? Does it not? What's the deal? Well, there's no footnotes on any of that stuff. But then we get some pretty, we get a lot of footnotes when we talk about some other stuff. Masks help prevent people who have COVID-19, including those who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, spreading the virus to others. So we got a footnote number 12 over here, and they're referencing another CDC document. Okay, so that's where that goes. Masks are primarily intended to, reprodu to reduce the emission of vi virus-laden droplets. They act as a source control by blocking exhaled virus. Okay, so it's actually to the mostly in this in this sentence here, the allegation that it's mostly to prevent other people who are already sick from spreading the virus. That's under paragraph 13. We see here, and that comes from a an article by NHL Lung Chu, somebody over at the Nature Medicine magazine from 2020. So that's sourced. Then we have another one. This is especially relevant for asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infected wearers who feel well and may be unaware of their infectiousness to others who are estimated to account for more than 50% of transmissions. 14 and 15. Uh, we got two studies there that they're referencing, which, you know, I, I haven't read these studies. I don't know, but at least they're referencing some studies. So I appreciate that. Masks also provide personal protection to the wearer by reducing the inhalation of droplets that they reduce the wearer's exposure through filtration. We got another study. That one comes over from this person, uh, Furoshura Ueki, and that was published in M Sphere magazine in 2020. So we got another footnote for that. So that's good. I appreciate that document. They also, uh, let's see here, the community benefit for wearing the mask control is due to the combination of these effects. Individual prevention benefit increases with increasing numbers of people using masks consistently and correctly. Then we don't have a footnote there. You know, we just don't see anything there about that. So it's sort of a conclusion after some evidence. Appropriately worn masks reduce the spread, particularly given the evidence of pre-symptomatic seven studies confirmed the benefit of universal masking in a community level analysis a German city, a U.S. state, a panel of 15 states in D.C., Canada, U.S., and nationally. Each analysis demonstrated the following. It said two of these studies. Uh, as, okay, with universal masking, new infections fell significantly. Additional analysis from 200 countries also demonstrated reductions in mortality. An economic analysis using U.S. data, given these effects, increasing universal masking by 15% could prevent the need for lockdowns and reduce associated losses of up to 1 trillion or 5% of GDP. Those sound like some pretty damn good benefits to me. You know, if we can mask up and just open everything, let's do that. All right. So here are some of the other sources that we see. We have another one from the end. This is from a government institution on 17. We have another one from the Institute of Labor Economics in Germany. We've got another one from uh, Arizona, this looks like. Community Mask, a natural experiment in the U.S. 
So you got some studies here. And all of that evidence, all of that information is to justify this. Therefore, I have determined, this is the CDC writing, that the mask wearing requirements of this order are reasonably necessary. And this is some legal language, right? They're saying it's necessary to prevent further introduction, transmission, or spread of COVID-19. Individuals traveling, they must wear the masks. Until further notice, the action is taking place. This, there's no end date on this. This is for it basically indefinitely at this point in time. Unless excluded or exempted, a person must wear a mask while boarding or disembarking and traveling on any conveyance into or within the United States. So don't think that this is just if you're leaving the country. Within the United States, a person must also wear a mask at any transportation hub that provides transportation in the U.S. To address these, this order, this is enforcement now. This is where we're getting into the criminal law. To address this. The public health threat and transportation security, this order shall be enforced by the Transportation Security Administration under appropriate statutory and regulatory authorities, including the provisions of the U.S. Code and the Code of Federal Regulations. That's if you're traveling with the TSA. This second paragraph is where it opens the entire can of potential criminal liability for anybody throughout the rest of the country. And I'm going to show you these different sites. 18 U.S. Code 3559, 3571, 42 U.S. Code 243, and the big ones are 268 and 271. It says this order shall be further enforced by federal authorities. So it shall. So you see here when we talk about statutory construction, shall be enforced by federal authorities and may be enforced by cooperating state and local authorities through the following provisions. And they give us all of this code. So as we talked about, the, the system of federalism that we live in, the feds can't go in and tell local law enforcement to do this stuff. But what they've done here is they've identified the different statutory provisions and they're basically providing cover for local law enforcement to say, if you want to enforce this stuff, we now have a federal order because this is a sort of a quarantine public health order under these, this U.S. code and these code of federal regulations. You now have the ability to follow the order and execute the protocols locally in your local vicinity. And they're saying that here. Now, they're not they're not necessarily saying that, but that's what they're saying may be enforced. And then they're referencing these U.S. codes. I'm going to show you these the pertinent U.S. code here in a minute. The sub note footnote that we see cited here at the end, it says 30 uh, footnote 33. While this order may be enforced and the CDC reserves the right to enforce through criminal pen penalties, the CDC does not intend to rely primarily on on these criminal penalties, but instead strongly encourages and anticipates widespread voluntary compliance as well as support from other federal agencies in implementing additional civil measures enforcing the provisions of this order to the extent permitted by law and consistent with President Biden's executive order of January 21st promoting COVID-19 safety in domestic and international travel. Okay, so they're not going to rely primarily on these, but maybe secondarily. Not the first thing, but maybe the second thing. Okay, so any of those, uh, you know, prior videos that you had seen about people sort of, you know, going bananas in the grocery store or traveling around or wherever in the airports, right? Maybe it's a, it's a nice question first. Can you put your mask on? And if the answer is no, criminal charges. It's all authorized under the public health provisions. Let's take a look at what those are. So as we saw... We've got U.S. Code 3559, 3571, U.S. Code 243, all of these provisions. These are the titles of those different provisions. Sentencing classification of offenses. So from, from Title 18 in the U.S. Code, these are the criminal provisions. So 3559 is talking about the sentencing classification and then the sentence of a fine, right? And when we get over to uh, Title 42, this is all public health stuff. So under 42243, it's the general grant of authority for cooperation. We've got the quarantine duties of the consular and other officers. And then we've got the penalties for violating the quarantine laws. Okay, and this is where we're going to spend some time talking about this. What happens if you violate the quarantine laws? These preceding provisions give them the ability to install these quarantine rules. But when you violate them, you're going to look to 42 U.S. Code 271. Then we have the Code of Federal Regulations. So the code is what the law says, and then the federal regulations is how you apply the laws. We've got interstate quarantine rules, and then we've got penalty rules. And then down here, the final 
Code of Federal Regulations, public health prevention measures to detect communicable disease. So what does this mean criminally speaking? Well, it's housed over here in the U.S. Code 271. These are the penalties for a violation of the quarantine laws. Any person, we've got two sections here. Section A, penalties for persons violating the laws. And Section B, penalties for vessels violating the laws. So people as individuals, people as uh, you know, public entities that are transporting people. If the vessels are violating the law, if you're transporting somebody, you have a different set of penalties. So first, the individuals. Any person who violates any regulation prescribed under these sections, which we just looked at, or any provision who enters or departs from the limits of any quarantine station, ground, anchorage, in disregard of the quarantine rules, or without permission of the quarantine officer in charge, shall be punished by a fine of not more than $1,000 or by imprisonment for not more than one year or both. So it cannot be more than a thousand bucks, cannot go to jail for more than one year. But those are, those are pretty serious penalties. So what if they say, well, we could send you to jail for a year for not wearing your mask, but we're only gonna ask for 30 days. That's how people take plea deals all the time. They say the law gives us the ability to send you to prison for a year. We're just going to give you 30 days jail. Will you take that deal? Would you take that deal? Many people would. Subsection B for the vessels and the carriers. Their rules are a little bit more harsh. They shall forfeit to the United States 5,000 bucks or uh, the amount to be determined by the court. It's going to be a lien on the vessel. The U.S. attorney shall appear on behalf of the United States. And um, we're talking about seizures of the vessels for violation. Those are the penalties there. There's another provision under the Code of Federal Regulations, 70.18. Persons in violation of this part are subject to a fine of not more than $100,000 if the violation does not result in death or both, I'm sorry, result in death or one year in jail or both, or a fine of no more than $250,000 if the violation does result in death or one year in jail as provided by law. And that's, that's just a different subsection. So they also reference that. So would they p potentially be trying to navigate into the CFR penalty? Or are we looking at the U.S. Code penalty? Any way you splice it, some pretty serious penalties are available. They're not saying what they're going to do. We don't even know whether or not they're going to prosecute these crimes. We don't know whether this is just a, an enforcement mechanism that's not going to ultimately be enforced, but it's available so they can make the threat. Or are we going to see people arrested and charged in court for these violations could be federally could be locally could be at an airport could be at a uber station we'll see it is into effect on february 1 so that was two days ago will remain in effect unless modified or rescinded so it's indefinite and it was signed off on by this fellow here, Martin S. Citrone, MD, the director of the Division of the Global Migration and Quarantine Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So that is the new mask order. One year in jail, $1,000 fine. You're going to wear your masks? I'm going to wear my masks, but 